my name is Theodore H. Friedgut, and I am going to talk to you today about Yusufka and Revolution, Volume 2. Volume 2 is concerned with the politics and revolution that developed in the years between the founding of Yusufka in, in 1869 and the changing of the name of the city officially to Stalino in 1924, marking Stalin's grasp of power after the death of Lenin. And so uh, we go th through this in a detailed stage-by-stage -stage, uh, performance that I hope will be of some interest to you. We start at the very beginning. What we had was uh, three different forces contending, two major forces and one new force that began to grow little by little. The two major forces were, of course, the autocracy and government uh, built on the Tsar and the nobility and the, the larger landowners. And the second force facing them was the growing power of the industrial capitalists who were uh, of a different mind than, than the autocracy-minded and conservative uh, nobility. Uh, they had a, a different you know, economy and society to try and develop. So they, they uh, got into squabbles with, with the Tsarist uh, administration while at the same time maintaining their loyalty to the Tsar in the, in the uh, minutes of the Congress of uh, Mining Industrialists uh, of the south of Russia. The little Tsarevich was born. Everybody cheered, and there's a repeated singing of God Save the Tsar, which goes on and on, and nobody wanted to stop it. it it's like the legends of the, the applause for Stalin at party congress is that nobody wanted to be the first one to stop clapping, so nobody stopped. Here they all kept singing God Save the Tsar until somebody finally said it was time to go to, go to business. Anyway, uh, they, they were patriots, but they were patriots of a different sort. Uh, they envisioned a different sort of uh, polity than did the, the Tsar and, and uh, the autocracy. The third force that I mentioned is, of course, the revolutionary movement, which is just beginning and uh, has a very slow and uh, very tortuous development. You could say up until the 1905 revolution, it had not been of any importance. But from 1905 to 1917, it gained in momentum and gained in strength. And we'll probably go into a lot of the details of that. After the establishment of Yusufka, uh, other factories are just beginning and other mining settlements are just beginning, but there is already a, a force that is uh, trying to establish itself. That's the industrialists. The autocracy, of course, is there. Any movement of the population was under police control. You were not allowed to uh, come to Yusufka without a passport from where the place that you left, although many did. There was uh, a great illegal population, you know, mostly outside of the town itself and in the surrounding mines you know, were people who were just looking for employment because the the land hunger in Russia was growing and the poverty in the villages was growing, particularly in the north. And these people came and if you didn't have a passport, you had to bribe the police not to chase you out or bribe the employer to take you in and uh, you were given lower wages. 
And th this began to foment a feeling of discrimination. Within, within the, you know, the powers that be, the industrialists and the Zemstvo had uh, an ongoing quarrel over taxation. The Zemstvo was, of course, the representative councils of rural districts that were established by, as part of the reforms of Alexander II in the 1860s and were to provide, in Russia, they did an important job in providing health care and in, in providing education. Uh, and they had the taxation of the lands in their area. And, of course, there was a difference in the taxation of uh, an agricultural estate or a coal mine and a metalworking factory. And the uh, industrialists felt they were being overcharged, which they probably were, because the Zemstvo was representing mostly the landed, uh, the landed gentry, the landowners, even though they may be... A, Small landowners, they were the ones who, who ran the Zemstva. And that, that was a, a big conflict from the beginning. So you get these inter, interplays uh, going all the time. And uh, you had the, the Tsar trying to keep control of this new process that was freeing people from, from their... You know, peasant villages and putting them into a new type of society and work and she was changing them and uh, the Tsar and his advisors knew what was going on in the world and saw how the French Revolution had come and that was a terrible shock that was that was their nightmare French Revolution where the, the, the king was beheaded and the queen was beheaded and they this, this was anathema to them. They couldn't stand it. And they saw America across, across the ocean and this business of democracy, which was totally foreign to the autocracy. They did not want a, that. They did not consider that a possibility. But somewhere that struck a bell because... Uh, there were new housing developments in in Yuzovka. One was called New York, with the idea that here this is we're going to make the New York of Russia. It's going to be the, the new society, the new country, the new freedoms. And uh, this this was uh, food food for conflict, fuel on the flames of, of a potential conflict, which eventually came about. We have all, all the beginnings there. However, the beginnings of the revolutionary movement were very tentative, very small. Workers in the factories, the peasants who came down from the north of Russia, the workers in the mines, were also peasants, are, were not revolutionaries. They were willing to well, strike or riot if their pay was delayed, as it was in 1875, and they, they had uh, quite a riot. The mines outside of Yuzovka with an attempt to break into Yuzovka and to break into the factory and uh, to come in and beat up some Jews and, and to smash, smash up the, the uh, bazaar in, the, in Yuzovka settlement. Uh, with the cry that, you know, our pay has been delayed, we're hungry, and if we're not going to have anything, you're not going to have it either. And they would smash a food stand or a grocery store or whatever came came to hand there. But these these were sort of spontaneous bunt, uh, the rebellion, that uh, when they got together and had a grievance, they, they made it made it known. Now, uh, one of the interesting things that appears here, this is five years, six years after the establishment of Yuzovka, during the, the rebellion, they, they tried to break into the factory. Hughes uh, 
assembled his, all his English workers and his veteran uh, Russian workers, armed them and put 40 of them on horses and uh, beat off the attack on the, on the factory, imprisoning you know, some of the people. Uh, those who remained free wanted to break into the factory to free their fellow workers. But it, there it was on the basis of people who worked with them in the mine who were prisoners. And those they saw as being their comrades and they had, they had a moral obligation to try and free them. Earlier, uh, when they first came, the first years that they had come, what you had was these parochial peasants they, who, whose, whose only loyalty was to their family or to their village. And even when they came down to Yuzovka, they lived together in an artel, in a, a cooperative or a commune, where people from the same village roomed together and shared the, the duties of, of uh, making their food and keeping, place, keeping the place habitable. And here we've transferred this parochial uh, village-centered or origin-centered loyalty to a working group where we work with these people. We, we share their li lives, and if they're in trouble, we have to help them. So we, we've already got a change in the psychology of the peasantry there. And that's, that's, I think, an important beginning towards what the Bolsheviks were always seeking, or all the Marxists were seeking, of class consciousness, of seeing that anyone who works is my comrade. And workers have to have a class, a class loyalty, and there will be class warfare. That was, that was a, an important development coming along. Well, the political and revo revolutionary tendencies were very weak until uh, oh, the World War I really destroyed Russia. Uh, for instance, in 1917, when uh, the February Revolution came about, the autocracy was unseated, and uh, a new democratic regime was being constructed, the then the revolutionaries could come out of the underground. Until that time, they had been underground and they had been you know, chased and, and uh, beaten and imprisoned by the autocracy. But in February 17, they came out. But there were only about a dozen Bolsheviks in the underground in Yuzovka. And Yuzovka, by that time, is a, is a town of 70,000 people. And all you had were a dozen Bolsheviks, most of whom were very young, uh, even teenagers, and uh, most of them not workers. Most of them were uh, you know, Jewish intellectuals, and so you can hardly see them stopping the, the rapid growth that was taking place in Russia. There was no significant strike movement until really 1905. There were these outbreaks in 1892. You had the cholera riots. Uh, I had mentioned in my earlier interview in, on Volume 1, the cholera riot in 1892, which turned into an anti-Jewish pogrom uh, against the doctors, against the, the, the Jews who didn't fall ill as often as, as did the Russian workers because they lived in better hygienic conditions generally. They, they were a, a stratum of service people who had a better life than did the, the workers in the mines and, and in the factory. So there, there you had a, a, an outbreak uh, that was serious but it was not directed against the against the factory owners or against the factory itself and in in fact when you have demands for uh, from the factory for uh, getting rid of an obnoxious foreman 
who likely as not would be hit by a steel beam and, and knocked out anyway. Uh, but uh, that was only a work accident, which happened all over the place in in these uh, primitive factories. Uh, or there was no attempt to uh, destroy the factory or to attack the factory, and no attacks on the English, really, except for Mr. Church, who ran a brewery and a pub on the side, and that that they they went after along with every other brewery or pub that they could find uh, to drink from because drink was always the the fuel of a uh, a riot so you you don't have a real revolutionary movement until you get to the 1905 revolution which begins really from the center but it spreads along the railways, and you did have in the in the Donbass uh, the the seizure of a, a, a station on the main rail line that turned into a battle of about five five thousand workers, I think it was, against uh, three hundred dragoons of the Russian army who came, and the three hundred just spread the 5,000 all over the countryside. They, they threw them out in merciless fashion. But, and you had a, a Soviet elected in Yuzovka, but being very moderate, its job was to keep the railway run running, keep the factory running, keep the mines running. They were not revolutionaries. It was certainly not a Bolshevik Soviet. But there was a, there was a Soviet elected, and that that in itself was important. John John Hughes had died by that time, and it was his sons, Arthur and John Junior and James, who were who were running the factory. Uh, they didn't really change it. They they started after 1905. They began to look around to, to get out. Until that time, they were. In Yuzovka, and the Yuzovka was their life, but they saw how things were developing, and they decided it was perhaps time to return to England, which one by one they they did, until in they they only managed to sell the place in uh, 1917. They started the the first real uh, negotiations and, and offers came in the beginning of 1914, but by the time they had negotiated, uh, World War I broke out, and they, the Hughes brothers insisted that they be paid in sterling in England. They weren't going to take rubles or anything else that, from some European country that was likely to fall uh, any minute to, to foreign invasion or to revolution. So by the time they, they got a a deal going. It was uh, 1917, and they got their payments. It was payments were made over a period of months in 1917. September 1917, the last payment was made in London, and uh, they were safely at home. You know, the, the factory had been taken over already by. Uh, they, first, the French, who were who were to who were the buyers of it, and uh, the English had been thrown out during 1917, as the working class uh, started taking more and more responsibility for it, and they they took this one fellow and threw him into a wheelbarrow, took him to the gates, and dumped him into a mud puddle, and that was his time to go home. He was uh, a senior official of, uh, for the Hughes administration there. Uh, that's the way that the... And the rest got the message and most of them packed up and went home during 1917. It was sold to a French company. They never had time to really get in and get organized because a month after they had paid their last payment, uh, the Bolsheviks came and took it over. 
and they they ran it uh, for 70 years, and and it's still running today under as a private company. It's essentially the same the in the same place. They've got new equipment, of course, but they're still coal and steel is Donetsk's life, and uh, that they they still they still go after it. There was in 1905, if we're talking of the politics and the revolution and the, the change that is taking place, the change of these peasants becoming workers and becoming modern citizens and perhaps aspiring to some say in their, in their state. In 1905, you had uh, the declaration by the Tsar uh, of uh, like the founding of a Duma and, and the granting of a Duma and, and elections and and in all over Russia there were huge meetings and in Yuzovka as well there was a huge meeting but attended by the intelligentsia uh, mostly Jews uh, mostly uh, people of a, a higher class celebrating the Tsar's granting of freedom. And then one of the orators says, well, the Tsar has granted us freedom, but here the workers are working the same as they always did. They should be out celebrating too. They must be made to understand that the Tsar has freed them from the tyranny that they've been under up to now. And so a large group with red flags and, and cheering and workers' songs went to the factory, pushed their way in, and told the workers, workers, come out and celebrate the Tsar has sent you free. You people are insulting our Tsar, and they begin throwing coal and, and pieces of, of cast iron and beating up these people. Well, it happened that among those who were there, there were some... The, the Jewish community had formed a self-defense group because they knew that anything like uh, that happened like in 19, 1892 could turn into a pogrom. And in 1903, there had been a very successful uh, self-defense group that had prevented a pogrom you know, in uh, one, of, one of the cities in Belarus. And so these people had thought they would, and some of them had pistols, and one pulled out his pistol and fired at the Russian workers. And then, you know, what had been simply to, to get them out of there turned into a bloody battle. Uh, well, somebody's going to shoot at the Russian workers, they wouldn't stand for that. And they grabbed people. Some of them were thrown live into the blast furnaces. Others were beaten to death there. It was, uh, and then out into the streets to, to beat up uh, and burn the Jewish quarter. Uh, this was uh, probably the, the worst uh, outbreak that had ever been. This is 1905. This is October 1905 when, when the Tsar had uh, decreed that there would be a Duma. He had, he had, uh, more or less give, given in to the de demands of the the democrats there what this was a revolution it was the bourgeois democratic revolution is the way that they the marxists uh, call it because the the cadet party the you know constitutional democrats had gained the power really because they were they were able to have the, the Duma, in which, and they were going to have a constitution, and they were going to legislate like any advanced country in you know, Europe or America. Of course, it didn't quite work out that way because the Duma you know, eventually was dominated by you know, conservatives and not by the liberal Democrats. And... Uh, but the, the, the reaction of the workers who didn't want revolution, they, they, they adored their czar, they respected their czar, and they were not yet re ready 
to be to be freed and to be told by uh, teenagers uh, and foreigners uh, what to do and so they they chased them out well it was important to seize control of the whole area because this was an area of workers this was the, the southern center of industry there were a number of other centers of, of industry but of heavy industry the coal mining and steel making you had it concentrated in the Donetsk basin and so it was it was a place where the Bolsheviks looked forward to the possibility of gaining influence and gaining control of serious economic power and uh, therefore it was important to them Donetsk did not have a, a large Bolshevik contingent. Oh, yeah. As I mentioned before, they, when they came out of the underground in February 1917, there were less than two dozen of them. And uh, they had to work very hard to get, to get influence. And it was largely through the sending of emissaries from the center and... Uh, for their Bolsheviks got regional control in, in the higher Soviets. They they didn't have control of the Yuzovka Soviet in 1917. Uh, the first Soviet, they had three or f four of the 50 places on the executive committee of the of the Soviet, where the Mensheviks had 20 places, and the socialist revolutionaries and and others had the rest of them. So it, it was not uh, a Bolshevik stronghold. But what happens is that in 1917, you know, chaos and anarchy are the, the, the key descriptive words for the whole of the Ukraine. The, the numbers of, of different forces, the white forces, the Bolshevik forces, the Austro-German forces up to November 1917, and very importantly, the Ukrainian national forces first make their their organized appearance in politics there. I mean, there had been a Ukrainian national movement as an intelligentsia movement, as a cultural movement. They were not allowed to be a political movement, just as the the revolutionaries were not allowed to be a legitimate political movement, but carried on underground. Now you have you have that, and in in January of 1918, you have the Central Rada takes control of Kiev for a very short time. The Bolsheviks kick them out, then the Germans kick the Bolsheviks out, and then it, it keeps rotating throughout 1918. And the people in the Donbass are very worried. Uh, they are Russian workers. They don't, first of all, even when the Bolsheviks for a few weeks had control in Kiev, they didn't see their future as being part of a Ukrainian republic. Now, they wanted to be affiliated to Russia. And so in January 1918, we get this very strange creature, the Donetsk Krivoyrog Autonomous Republic. They declared that republics do not have to be on a national basis. They can be on an economic basis. Any large area that has a, a common economy, like the Donbass with Krivoyrog, supplying the iron ore and the Donbass, the metallurgical factories and the coal. We will be an independent republic affiliated federally to a federative socialist Soviet Republic of Russia. So they would be autonomous, but hanging on to Mother Russia. They did not want to be Ukrainians. It, it wasn't a decision by Moscow, it was a local decision, and uh, the, the leaders of this movement, uh, Sergeyev, Artyom Sergeyev, and uh, 
Mezhnauk, who was the finance minister, they were called by Lenin to Moscow, and it was explained to them that without the numbers and the quality of proletariat that there is in the Donbass and, and Krivorog areas, if those leave the Ukraine, the Bolsheviks will lose the Ukraine. They will have no representation there because this is the proletariat and the, they, the Bolsheviks must remain part of the Ukraine in order to bring the Ukraine into Soviet Russia. And so Lenin dressed them down and explained the facts of life to them. And in March of 1918, that is two, two months after it was declared an autonomous republic, uh, Sergeyev, who is the uh, prime minister, the head of the, the autonomous republic of Donetsk and Krivirog, takes part in the Congress of Ukrainian Soviets, that is, that is held and that was the end the end of their autonomy they were going to be part of of the ukraine and they there was talk of a feder federative ukraine that would have you know, a number a number of different republics in it but that died away and they remained part of the ukraine it didn't matter much because the white army soon uh, came into the donbass and and conquered it, the Germans came in, Every, it was just a, a rotation of power and the total, total uh, destruction of, of any organized administration there until the end of the Civil War when everyone was bleeding and wounded and most were dead but the Bolsheviks were the last to remain on the battlefield and they they were able to then turn to reconstruction and to beginning to build the Soviet Union. After all, the Soviet Union was not uh, not declared uh, in 1917. You had the Russian Soviet Federated Republic, and then now little by little they got other republics to go Soviet and to join them. And only in the beginning of the 20s was the Soviet Union you know, formed. And, and, and even then, you had the, the campaigns out in Central Asia to bring in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and then to kick out the Emir of Bukhara, etc. Uh, so uh, this, this was a, a very interesting... Prelude to to what's happening today, when the, the whole Donbass and Krivirog wanted to get out and join Russia, uh, but was told by Lenin to stay in the Ukraine because otherwise the Bolsheviks won't have any influence in the Ukraine. I wonder if Putin has read this history and and seen what happened there, and what what his reading of it is today. It's quite relevant, I think. In, in Ukraine, as a political power, Central Rada government under Khrushchevsky was uh, ready to, to set up a democratic socialist Ukraine as an independent republic. And in their fourth universal in January of, of 1918, they declared the absolute independence of, of Ukraine. It wasn't going to be part of Soviet Russia at all. It was going to be an independent country as it tries to be today. Uh, it it took, took another 90 years or so before they, they were able to, to do it. But uh, the, the Rada was uh, kicked out uh, very quickly by the Bolsheviks who were kicked out by the Germans. And then, then came uh, Skoropadsky's regime which was you know, dependent on the Germans and Austro-Hungarians and this merry-go-round of, of uh, regimes fighting over the Ukraine until it, it took on its Soviet nature and became part of the Soviet Union which lasted until 
1991. Who would want to give up? This is still a very you know, large and influential economic uh, portion of the country. And they, uh, the use of Castile works uh, still exports steel uh, to various countries of the world. The coal is still dug there. Meanwhile, there are other other industries that have grown up around that uh, over the years, and the heavy industries. And this is I mean, Dnipropetrovsk is still a very important uh, industrial city for the Ukraine, and they regard it as being part of the of the Ukrainian territory. When well, the the fourth universal specified that Yekaterinoslav Gubernia and Kharkov Gubernia would be part of the Ukraine, the rebuilding, the reconstruction period was very interesting because here you the the battle is no longer there's no longer a Zemstvo there's no longer a Congress of of the Southern Mine and Metallurgy Industrialists there's no longer the autocracy. But within the, the Bolshevik Soviet powers, there is still room for, for a great fight. idea of autonomy was very strong there. That is, they weren't automatically taking Moscow's dictate on anything. And when, when Stalin was beginning to make his, his order you know, for the Soviet Union... In now, Yuzovka, they still thought independently, and there were <clears throat> a lot of a lot of uh, supporters of Trotsky there. I mentioned in the first interview that between Yuzovka and Stalin, oh, there was about a week where the uh, Yuzovka Soviet had proclaimed that the name of the city would be changed from Yuzovka to Trotsk. Uh, but that was quickly dropped. It was, it, it never never got into the history books, certainly. Uh, but there is a in the you know, Donetsk archive there is a, a, a notice from in the Izvestia uh, Yuzovskovo Sovieta the news of the Yuzovka Soviet. There is a report of a decision to call the city Trotsk. But it, then it turned to Stalino and everyone very piously says, oh Stalino, it means it's steel and that's the, oh, the steel that we produce here in Donetsk. It's not for Stalin's name. Oh no. <laughs> but nobody would believe that, I don't think. <laughs> they were good Stalinists too. And the Trotskists little by little were pushed out and so were Bukharin's people pushed out and, and the, the Stalinists remained. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed the privilege. Bye-bye.